Yeah, finally. Welcome to my stream. This is Tiger, and I had some problems to make OBS um, broadcast my Train Sim World 3. For the first time, it just stayed dark. But now we are here. Today, you are in for um, one of the all time greatest scenarios in Train Sim World Kalinchfield Railroads the limited power scenario that gives us some opportunity to look at really old diesel electric locomotives with direct current traction motors hello AJ thank you for moderating the stream again I hope you uh, have settled down comfortably so that you can actually enjoy this rather long scenario you can see it is a max difficulty scenario rated with one hour and fifty if you are rushing through it what we won't do most probably <laughs> so we cannot play in winter unfortunately because in scenarios I cannot select the weather it always has a scripted weather on its own so we will have to take what we get and this is not winter let's just jump into it the Clinchfield Railroad is a DLC that is set back in the 70s uh, of the last millennium we have to say and we are on a railroad that sports these really big old very beautiful EMD F7 locomotives and we are here mainly to get coal from out of the mountains and carry it down into the valleys and uh, I already missed what the game told us. The thing is, it is called limited power because we only have two locomotives. Normally with these F7s we have so-called B units in between that add additional power to the consist and we have them not in this scenario. We have those two locomotives. Those two locomotives are actually running. The one that is malfunctioning is already taken out of the consist. So what do we do to set up our locomotive here? First thing is always to turn on some lights. We are doing coal shunting. A lot of it and in the gradient. What is really great in this DLC because we are shunting not on level ground but in the hills with steep 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 gradients. To set up this locomotive, the first thing what the game usually does not tell you is we have to select how many locomotive units we have. We have two. Um, that's why we put the selector to two. This is important later for the dynamic brake. This is the valve that sets the independent brake. It is freight or passenger if it is the leading cap freight if it is a long train, passenger if it is a short train and uh, lap position if it is the cap or the locomotive that is trailing so the leading one goes into lap and uh, this is our I think it's a 24L brake valve for the automatic train brake it has already been cut in here is the cutout valve so this valve is already functional we have brake gouges as we know them from a lot of uh, other locomotives of the diesel electric area most important here on the right the red end for the brake cylinders and the white for the brake pipe here is the equalizing reservoir the main reservoir and in the middle for the i think for the application pipe and the suppression pipe they are not so important but they jump around a lot this brake valve has a manually lapping feature, so we will have to um, use that in a specific way, unlike those more modern locomotives that have automatic uh, lapping. To get this consist moving, we can just follow what the game is telling us. 
we set the reverser to forward we have already set the rotor valve to fright set the control and fuel pump to on you find it here on those switches this is for the headlights first control and fuel pump generate the field engine run those three switches you know from the sand pitch grade diesel electrics and now a thing that we do not have in more modern uh, locomotive a transition lever here it is to off at the moment and the game tells us to put it into series parallel what this is about we will have a little uh, presentation later on and also what this switch is for the transition cutout switch that is put to auto at the moment and that can put can be put to man for manual maybe this is Hank <coughs> I don't know we will have a conductor actually I don't think this is Hank uh, Hank is not here in the locomotive he is here in his caboose typically on those oldish freight trains we had a special car at the end of the train that was called a caboose and a crew member could ride there and has his own seat you can see it through the window here and uh, he actually has his own brake valve I don't know if we can go into the caboose to see that maybe we can with the camera yeah and we can go up there and we can see if we can actually move in here with the camera sometimes it works sometimes you get stuck like I got stuck at the moment yeah anyway there is <coughs> excuse me there is a gouge that reads the brakes you can see it here through the window so this is a meter a gouge that tel tells us about the status of the brake pipe at the end of the train you know that from the more modern locomotive on the Cajon Pass for example we had this end of train device that was radioing, radioing those readings to the locomotive here we have actually a crew member sitting here and reading the gouge in real life if you want to know how much pressure we have in the brake pipe at the end of the train now Hank has a beard okay Hank has a beard and he's sitting in the caboose and this is just another crew member that was assigned to us and is supposed to help us back to setting up the train transition lever to series parallel and then they want us to release the independent brake what is full on at the moment the automatic brake is at first service a safety device we have a safety pedal that usually should be pressed as soon as we are operating the brakes and stuff and uh, most of the time we should have our foot on the paddle and it should be depressed so that we can work here is our speed clock this is our amp meter here so we can see how much power we are generating and trying to get on the track okay we release the independent brake we release the automatic brake we apply some power and make the train move this little thing here a red plague is more or less a stop sign sometimes you can actually spat out when you run one of those but not always here the signaler just says okay proceed sometimes it is wise to radio the signaler before you pass a sign like this so that you can get permission to pass it so train has started at first we are restricted to 15 miles before we get on the main line then we can go a bit faster What is a bit annoying about this locomotive is that this this <laughs> this rope here not the sun visor the rope for the horn you can see these are, are for the horns yes the rear one and the front one and someone thought it a good idea to fix it up in a position where it is in the way so that you cannot read the speed clock here properly 
So either you have to divine the reading of the speed clock by the back end of the uh, hand or you use this view and look through your window then you can see uh, the speed clock or if you're actually slowing down was good that we honked because we're going into a tunnel going into a tunnel requires you to honk quite often when you're actually slowing down then you can see it because then somehow the position of the engineer in the train gets moved and uh, we can't see it but when we're accelerating the horn strap gets in front of the speed clock so we have to guess a bit so again we need Hank in the caboose to tell us whether we are on the main track and Hank says okay we are across the switch we can accelerate a bit can see it here actually this is a part of the track when we can go 30 but it most probably won't make a lot of sense to go so fast but now we're accelerating and the grip for the horn gets into the line of sight on the speedometer apart from that I really like this locomotive it is super beautiful in my opinion It has some classification lights here and here that we can turn on. There is a switch for the classification lights. Oh, we we got the number lights should be on, I guess. Yes, number lights, we forgot them. But maybe those lights are not necessarily needed here if they have the same indication that the classification lights in Canada have then we don't need it because we are not a special train that is not in the timetable in the manual you can read that from the nose compartment that is not accessible in the game but that is accessible in real life you can actually change the colors of those classification lights so we need to slow down a bit because we are going across the switch here to the right I'm not entirely sure if this yellow uh, aspect just warned us that we are diverging or whether this is an approach signal I did not really find the uh, reliable sources about the Clinchfield Railroad signaling system so it might just tell us that we are diverging and on the diverging line we are again what are we? 20 okay 20 we can go here then we can accelerate again a bit and with the HUD off we do not really see what values we get for the gradient but maybe I can turn it on later so that you can see that we are getting into into really crazy gradients of up to almost 4 uh, per mil what is insanely steep for railroading so you can see that our cars are unloaded empty at the moment our train is uh, 1600 feet almost that is about a mile isn't it? it's a bit short of a mile 
and even empty it is uh, more than 1000 tons. We will not load the whole train with coal. Actually the train will be split and a different locomotive that is already waiting uh, at the loading station will take the second half of the train fill it at a different place with coal and then uh, take it down into the valley while we have to deal with the first half of the train Coming back to this lever here, you see that we are not switching it um, beyond the one position here. This is because we are operating in automatic transition mode. If we were to operate in manual transition mode, we would have to adjust the transition modes or we have to activate the transitions the transitioning in our electro traction motors. We will have a look at this as soon as we are uphill with our train. Now there is a little part where we are actually running downhill again before the real the real ascent starts. So I had to stop the train a little bit so that we're not running into speeding so the train does all the transitioning automatically so we just for driving forwards for, appra for, for applying traction force we just have to put this lever into the one position the series parallel and the train does the rest. But in case this automatic transitioning breaks or malfunctions, we can always go back to manual transitioning by switching the switch at the back of our seat. And what this magic transitioning is will be really uh, revealed. Hank, everything okay at the back of the train? Seems like it. Everything seems to be okay. Can I open this window? No, I cannot open this window. But we can read his bake, brake pipe gouge and this is almost at 90. That is good. Yes, I already have a gold medal in this scenario. I played it like... I think two or three times already. Because it is really an all-time greatest scenario, but it takes r some time, so you don't play it three times a day. And it's been a while that I played it last. The scenery has sometimes some quirks, but all in all I think it is a really really beautiful DLC with those woods and those steep single track railroads here. No pressure in terms of metal, no. The real challenge in this the, in this scenario is to do the shunting in the gradient and not end up with a runaway train in the end, in my opinion. Because if you do not really know how to switch ends at the cap and employ your dynamic brake, then you will most probably end up with uh, a runaway train. Because then you will be going down the descent that we are or the, the hill that we are climbing at the moment with a train full of coal and if you don't know how to stop this 
to slow this down then the train will pick up speed insanely fast and um, you probably won't be able to stop it again and if you're lucky you just have to let it, the train run down the hill and hope that you don't derail but obviously I'm going to try and not let the train run away on our way down and when you switch the, the, the ends, when you switch caps, you need to be cautious because the game is actually kicking you in your knees when, when you're doing this. We will see that later. So long Hank can be quite relaxed, but later he will be mighty busy. So this is Hank's seat, you cannot see Hank, but his seat at least. The other guy is still with us. I guess at some point he will just vanish and go home. They tend to do that. But you can see we are already in notch 7, just to not go slower. When climbing here, we can just turn on the hut for a little bit. Okay, this is 2.0 2 per mil, but it is getting worse gradient-wise. Let's open this little window a bit and that window so that it does not get too hot inside the cab. Yeah, this little window is really great. I love that they animated it. And you can actually, when you open and close it, you can see this this uh, lever for the window turn and <laughs> turn back. That is really good work. I always want to tie a knot into this cord for the for the horn, so that I can see my speedometer. But, unfortunately, I can't. Yes, it would be even harder in winter. Because... Um, you probably have less friction between the wheels and the rails and would have to apply sand what you can do this machine has a sander here and you would you would uh, yeah you would have to be even more cautious when uh, shunting and coupling up and moving your train in in the in the gradient it can happen 
if you're going too fast then you can totally lose the friction between the wheels and, and the rails and if you're too fast and apply brakes then you stop your wheels and the wheels just slide down slide down the rails yeah well if you get the runaway train here on the way downhill then most likely you are actually rolling downhill not sliding downhill sliding downhill is usually a thing that does not work out forever because you will probably derail sooner or later yeah sliding due to ice sliding due to the steel of the wheels and the rails getting so cold that the friction between the cold metal parts is reduced even more and then obviously the ice in between getting a quick look at the gradient 2.2 now And already we are at the maximum power that our locomotives can apply. Each one of those F7s are rated with 1500 horsepower. What is not much if you compare that with contemporary locomotives. This is why you usually have consists pulled by four of those locomotives, two A units and two B units in between. Yeah, Hank probably climbed out of, of this window with his camera and is filming his own chair. But you can see we are at full throttle and we are just between 15 and 20 miles and not really accelerating I think at the next bend or behind the next bend we will pass the locomotive that is supposed to help us later 
that will take the second half of the train and fill it we actually have 31 cars 33 is the consist, two locomotives, one caboose so 30 hoppers for the coal Fifteen of which we will have to take down ourselves and the other fifteen will be taken down by a fellow locomotive that we are bound to pass very soon. But you can see the speed drops even if we are even though we are on full throttle. We are at three point four gradient now. And those are values. Yeah. Having a partner loco with its own crew and being AI drivers, they are so quick. They have easier physics than we have. 3.4. So this part. I think it's the steepest part <coughs> on the track and if you're coming down the hill with your heavy coal train running in a 3.4 per mil gradient then you are better fast on the brakes otherwise you have a runaway train scenario Three point four all the time. <coughs> Today I have a glass of water. Yeah. Here, this is the locomotive that is going to help us. You can see that it is a locomotive and not a car because there is smoke coming from its fans. And those are the guys that will take care of our cars. Number 810, we are 806. Check 3-4. You can see the speed dropping even more, even if the speed clock is behind the cord for the horn. <coughs> yes. We will have to stop soonishly, but we are not fast. So now we are on the last thousand yards. And we will stop even without braking just by just by taking away the throttle. And then we have to brake so that we don't roll backwards again. So this is one of those contraptions where the coal comes from the mountains and is filled into the cars. And I think the other locomotive and the other crew will take this. What are they called again? Dimple or something like this? <coughs> it has a funny name. 
We will see it. We will see it in the in the objective description soon enough. Now we can see our target. This is where we are getting our coal. And those are the sidings where we are going to perform our shunting. And behind this coal loading facility the track actually ends. Just check check the switches that the switches are all set. Yeah. No need for Hank to get off and set the switches at this point. So, I just take away the throttle. And let the train more or less... You can see how the velocity drops just by taking away the throttle. I have to keep the throttle at 4 so that the train doesn't roll backwards. mustn't stop too early otherwise we cannot get into the correct siding okay this is where we belong you must now split your consist and start filling the cars up the F7 at Kilgo Creek has been requested to assist you yeah that was the one that we passed and that, the, that is the one that is going to help us. Maybe it is already here. Hank can have a look. No, they are not yet here, but they will be here soon enough. Okay. We have to uncouple hoppers. Unfortunately, they don't tell us how many we have to uncouple, but we can see it here where the coupling needs to be done. So we have to leave part of the track there and split our trains here. From what you could see when I um, yanked in the brakes I stopped the train obviously with the train brake, the automatic brake and to apply enough braking force to hold the train in place I needed to move the lever through the initial position and the lap position into the service position. In the service position the brake pipe actually gets drained, you lose the pressure and accordingly the uh, brake cylinders in the cars are filled and then you go back into a lap position to hold that uh, value in the brake pipe. So you don't um, use your brake valve like on more modern trains where you set it to 60% and then you have 60% brake power or to 80 and then you have 80% you have to do it like on the class 101 that we once had in, a, in, a, in one of the early streams you have to let brake force <laughs> into your imaginary brake vessel and then lock it in there we will see that a couple of times I also apply the independent brake so that we are quite secure and now this is the first um, job for Hank to cut the trains or to cut the train I don't know if he can actually go so far the problem is when I'm using the camera I um, don't get the reading whether I'm I am at the correct position oh is the train actually rolling backwards or is it just making noises no it is not rolling I think you can just hear the cars moving and the couplers. So we, we have to look actually which car
car needs to be the first that is cut off so we have one two starting from the switch and the others need to be cut off I guess this is one two this is the one where we have to cut it I guess is that the r right one Hank try it yes it was the correct one and now there is an interesting question I don't know when you're ready to set off apply a small amount of power before releasing to brake to avoid rolling backwards and recoupling the wagons that's the thing obviously we do not want to recouple here again the first thing that I wanted to uh, talk about is why are those cars now they are no longer coupled to our uh, locomotive not running downhill why are they sitting here and not moving an inch I don't know in real life I think Hank would have to fasten the uh, hand brakes on those cars first here every car has a hand brake it is released here but it can be fastened and I guess in real life you would fasten some of those hand brakes before you uh, uncouple your cars in the gradient of that kind you can maybe argue that as soon as you uncouple them you uh, sever the brake pipe like here the uh, ends are no longer connected so the brake pipe gets drained in those cars so all the brakes in the cars get applied uh, so the cars are held in place by the train brake maybe this works I would not necessarily rely on it because the auxiliary reservoirs that fill the brake cylinders they might have enough air to do that once or twice but as long as they are no longer connected to the brake pipe uh, then they cannot be replenished from the compressor that sits in the locomotive and so they get drained eventually but uh, in the game you don't have to worry about that you don't have to fasten the handbrakes this would be a bit uh, tedious I guess and you cannot do that in a game so as long as the cars are uncoupled they are not moving they are just sitting there even if they are sitting in the gradient the thing is we want to move our train to the front and we don't want it to roll back so as soon as I release the brakes obviously the train would start rolling backwards and they would couple again to the cars that we just uncoupled and we don't want this to happen so we m have to make sure that we don't roll backwards when we start the train now so we have to apply a decent amount of propulsion before we actually release the brakes and I have both brakes uh, fastened so that we can do that carefully enough so throttle first you can see on the amp meter that we are actually getting some power and then I first release the train brake and then even a bit more power and then gradually I release the independent brake that only breaks the locomotive and then I can just balance it out with my power <coughs> and if we look back to Hank we made it away from the uncoupled cars without rolling backwards into the coupling let's just check if the switches are all right they are <coughs> and you can see this is actually the end of the of the line here there is only a footpath that leads even further up the hill but the tracks end and this is just the shunting head for us <coughs>
again even though we have less cars now we need a throttle of three to not roll backwards actually we are in a gradient of 3.3 .3 here still so this is in a really insane gradient okay oh. oh unfortunately I yanked the brake lever into emergency what do we do if we if that happens then the 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 PCS the PC switch activates and this light lights up you can usually turn it off again by moving the reverse into neutral and back into front or so then you can use it normally so at the moment I have a bit too much brake force in our brake pipe but we will release that again before we actually go on with the mission with the service I wanted <coughs> to do this little, little presentation about this thingy here the transition lever and the transition cutout switch and what does this stuff do and for that I have prepared a little presentation that you can hopefully see now it is about a thing this is your wheel on your locomotive and if you want to start your locomotive then you start with a slow speed and at the slow speed you need a lot of force to turn the wheel around its uh, circumference once while as when the wheel is turning faster you don't need that much force anymore to turn the wheel around once what you want then is to turn the wheel fast that is something that everybody knows uh, when you try to, to ride a bike where, where the gears got stuck at the moment that you're starting the your, your ride you need a lot of force to turn the pedals around even once and you stand up to apply your weight onto the pedal and as soon as you are running then um, usually y you can not really go any faster anymore because the pedals are uh, turning all by itself you only need to apply very little force and um, you can't make them turn more and faster to gain more speed so <coughs> this is the typical uh, thing that at the moment when you're starting your train you need a lot of force to turn the wheel and you don't want that many uh, rotations per minute while as when you're running faster you need the more rotations per minute of the wheel otherwise you cannot go faster but you don't need that much force to turn the wheel anymore and your electric motors your traction motors that typically sit on the axle that connect the wheels so this is from looking from the side of the train um, they need to be controlled in a way that they can deal with those two uh, situations and all the situations in between and an electric motor like the traction motors a DC motor that is a motor that gets direct current has the char characteristic that the higher the voltage that the motor gets the more rotations per uh, minute uh, it will it will do so if you apply a low voltage to the motor then you will get a low rotation per minute values and at the same time if you put a lot of amperage current amps on the motor then you get a lot of force by turning the shaft once so uh, low voltage leads to low rotation per minutes high voltage to high rotations per minutes and otherwise uh, contrary for that um, a high value in amps in the current leads to a high torque a high force to or a great force to turn around the shaft and the wheel while as a lower number of amps leads to a lower value so this is if you want to um, deal with a situation like here where you can deal with a low uh, rotation per minute value but need a lot of torque force then 
you want to feed your motors a low voltage but high amps and the other way around if you are in this situation and want to deal with this situation then you want to feed the motors a high voltage with lower amps accepted to deal with this situation obviously those are more or less the two extremes and in between there are a lot of uh, situations where it goes from one situation to the other so you need to deal with that and the problem is you cannot just adjust the voltage and the amperage on the direct current or let's say now you can now we have a lot of, of gimmicks that can uh, do a lot of those things but in the days back in the days 1950 when those uh, machines were built that we are working with today we did not really have that and we needed to implement some things to get this situation done you had your diesel engine and you had a generator in in, in your uh, in your engine in your locomotive the diesel engine uh, according to the throttle setting idle to eight uh, provided a certain number of rotations per minute on its shaft the higher the throttle the more rotation per minute this shaft was connected with the generator the generator was um, generating electric current, direct current. This is why it's, it's a generator, not an alternator. And with uh, a certain force, and uh, this force uh, depended on the throttle setting in the diesel engine. And obviously, this force comes with a certain voltage and a certain amperage. And uh, if the voltage is high, the amperage is low, and the other way around. So the power output of, the, of this genera generator for every throttle setting is more or less always the same. So everybody who is really a, tech, uh, a technician and an electric engineer, please don't crucify me. I really try to get the, the principle here, and um, it might not always be totally exact in, in terms of physics, but I think it is important to see the general principle how this works. This is our locomotive if you look at it from below or from the top. So those are the wheel bases, the wheels, the axles and in the middle the traction motors and they are typically connected in bogies. So our F7 has two bogies with two axles each and has four traction motors. So every traction motor sits in the middle of, of the axle and turns the axle around. If I want to have those motors to uh, get uh, high amps, even if the voltage is low... Oh, maybe... Can you see it now? Yeah, you can see it now. I, for some reason, this needs to be clicked twice. <coughs> then you can see it. So. If you want to feed your um, your traction motors with high amps, even if you accept a low voltage, then you can connect it in this way. You just yank the current through all the um, traction motors. If you understand a voltage like the driving force and um, the for yeah, if you understand electric currents like electrons running through a wire. The voltage is the driving force that drives the electrons through the wire, while the amperage is the amount of electrons that run through the wire. And if you connect your traction motors in a serial fashion, then all the electrons that are in the wire go through all the traction motors and do the work there. But at the same time, the driving force gets divided by the number of motors because every electron has to push every motor. So this is a very simple and naive uh, idea of that. But I think <coughs> it, ex it explains the thing in a way that it is very understandable if even if you do not come from a technical background as I. And then you end up on each traction motor with the full number of amperage that the generator is generating, but only one quarter of the voltage. And this is the situation that we want when we start our locomotive, right? We want high torque. That's why we get high amps 
and we accept that the rotation per minute is low and this is why we can deal with a relatively low voltage in this situation. This is full serial. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the other extreme, again our wheelbase here, we connect it not in a serial fashion, but we connect it in a parallel fashion. So the wire goes into every motor separately. And that leads to a situation where the electrons that run in the wire get divided. Only a quarter of the electrons go through this traction motor, only a quarter through this, and so on. Whereas the driving force stays the same on every motor. So we end up with a situation where we have the full voltage on every driving motor, on, uh, traction motor, and um, only one quarter of the amperage that the generator is providing. And this is the situation that we want to have here, where we want a high rotation per minute. This is why we need high voltage, but we no do not need that much torque, because turning the wheel around in uh, fast speed is not so important. And this is the full serial thing. Obviously, if you're running into in a gradient, this thing here gets amplified. Yeah, You need high torque longer if you're running uphill and you don't need that much torque if you're running downhill obviously. Full parallel? Did I say something else? Did I say full serial again? I'm sorry, this is like I said on, on, on my presentation, this is full parallel. And obviously between those two extremes, full serial and full parallel, it is possible to connect the motors um, in an intermediate way. For example, you connect two motors in one bogey in a serial fashion, but the two pairs in a parallel fashion. And then you have a serial parallel um, thing, uh, connection. And um, this is what our locomotive has for the first for the first uh, setting where we start with our transition lever. And changing the setup of your motors from one situation here into another like this or any in between, this is called a transition. That is where you transition your, your motors. And um, it can be done manually with a lever or it can be automatically when the locomotive uh, realizes, okay, I do better in a different transition, and then it switches it automatically. And um, that the engineer knows when to change the transition. The amp meters, not in our game, unfortunately, but if you look into uh, the manual here, the manual 2310, fourth edition of 1950, you find this picture of an amp meter, and you have those green areas that actually tell you when to switch your transition. So if the load goes beyond here and reaches the second green thing, then you switch to the next transition. Uh, notch and so on and when going down the same more or less so I want to show you this so that um, you can see how in, in the manual this is described to so that the engineer knows when to switch the transition in case he has to do it manually back to the game so in our game we have this transition lever here, and that is serious parallel. I think this is a situation where we have two pairs of traction motors uh, set in a parallel fashion. If you switch it on, you get into serious parallel shunt. This is a setup, I did not explain what that is. It does not have to do anything with shunting, like in getting cars from one track to the other and building up a train. It is a shunt for the electrons in the traction motor. Um, I don't want to get into this too much, um, but it is more or less the same principle. You take some part of the current that runs through the motor to uh, create the electromagnetic field that you need in the motor, and this does not go through the, uh, through the other coil 
on, on the rotating part of, of the motor, so you lose a bit of um, amperage here. So series parallel shunt is a bit more towards the parallel setup than com compared to series parallel. And at the moment I cannot switch the lever on, even if I should switch this here to manual uh, transitioning, because this is only possible if my throttle uh, lever is at 7 or 8, and uh, then I can go on. Then the next thing would be um, parallel, that is a full, full parallel setup like we had in the presentation, notch 3, and notch 4 would be parallel shunt. Then we have this shunt for the electrons in the motor that uh, even move it more towards the situation where you divide your amperage through all the shunting motors and have the full voltage on each and every one. I actually do not know if this is modeled in the game at all or correctly because usually I all always drive with automatic transitioning and so we leave this transition lever when we are driving in the one position so the train switches the transitioning on its own and we do not have an ampere meter where we can see at what point we have to uh, switch the transitioning we would have to guess it from the load and from the numbers when we compare it with this um, other picture from the operating manual. So much for the theory about uh, DC traction motors. I think it is always interesting, at least for me it is interesting, to understand why we have those weird levers and switches in our locomotives and what they do actually. But we go on with our, with our mission. What do we have to do? We have to stop with our remaining tra uh, train in another siding. <coughs> you can see here is the, 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 the part of our train that we cut off still standing there. You can see here is already the, the other locomotive that is supposed to help us. It is already waiting here for one half of the train and we have to get the other half of the train here in this siding so that it is actually divided into two cuts and let's just see if our switches are correct and they are not so tra uh, Hank actually has to travel on the end of the train and has to set the switch here I will not switch it here in the in the map because I want Hank to do it so Hank be nice enough <coughs> oh no Let's not use this camera for Hank, because we might need it at the front. Here, Hank was already here. So Hank, please step on your favorite position at the end of the train. And then we will go back. And you will see, I won't apply any throttle at all. I will just release the brake and you can see how fast our train is picking up speed here. So. I release the train brake and I release carefully the independent brake and as soon as the air gets out of the brake cylinders no throttle applied at this moment this is how the train picks up speed just by releasing the brakes insane so I have to reapply some independent brakes And even the independent brakes here, yeah, I think I can slow the train down. If the independent brake is not enough, then I obviously have to use the train brake. I think the independent brake is enough to keep the train in place when we are standing still in the gradient but it is not enough to actually slow down the train when it is already running. So this is the other end of our train. This is the switch that Hank has to set. Thank you, Hank. 
you can go back on your car actually I should use the horn when I start the train and this time I use the independent brake so that the train does not get that fast in the first place you can see this is just impressive no it does not punish us and I'm actually not sure if we are in this special condition in this in this special situation in the 70s up in the hills where, uh, where there is nobody around if that if we are actually required to use the horn here when shunting in the Canadian rules we have seen that um, once sounding the horn when all the shunting moves start might be enough so you don't have to blow your horn for each movement when you're doing the shunting <coughs> When shunting it is always, well, a bit of a judgment call whether you use your independent brake alone or your train brake. The independent brake usually is faster and um, more precise, but it might not be enough to slow down the whole train. And uh, obviously you can stretch your train in a situation like this when you only use the independent brake that only works on the loco not on the train and if you want your cars to be stretched then you can use the independent brake here when shunting downhill if you don't want this to happen then you should use your train brake Behind our caboose you can see the other locomotive waiting. Was that not enough? Let's see. Ah, just not enough. We have to go all the way back behind our own caboose so that the train registers so not fouling the switches at the end of our shunting movements Okay. Now we have to uncouple the hoppers that we still have on our train. This can actually be done by this bolt headed guy. He can disconnect. Where is the lever? Here's the lever, right? Tipple, it is called a tipple. The thing where we where we get the coal. Hoppers are those cars. I'm not entirely sure which cars qualify as hoppers usually, but um, at least I understand uh, under hopper a car that can be filled from above that is open more or less, and uh, yeah, like for loading coal. And Hank already got to the end of our locomotive, that is good. So Hank can actually ride in the back cab. Let's put him here. And as soon as we go away, I think we can see how this other locomotive is going to pick up those cars here. But first, we have to leave this part of the track, otherwise 
the locomotive won't roll into it. So I release the automatic brake first, I still have the independent brake on and still I don't want to roll into my hoppers so I apply throttle first and then release the independent brake can do it a bit quicker now since we are running light it is only the locomotive that we are moving let's see if any switches need to be set yes switches need to be set we need to go on the third on the third track here so when I'm running only with the locomotive then I am only using the independent brake that is totally enough oh this is Hank this is the other guy obviously so the other guy can set the switch here and now we are going the correct way I think you can go back in your body <laughs> oh no we are actually supposed to go in the middle track sorry you have to do it again you have to switch this switch and back on the locomotive at the same time, I just want to see what the other locomotive is doing. It is still waiting. So, we are going here only for shunting purposes. Again, let's see if the other locomotive is picking up our hoppers now. Is she? No. Oh yeah, you can see now she's coming in and is picking up our hoppers. Let's see how gentle they are doing this yeah they are doing it very gently they are actually stopping in front of it that is nice flop they are turning off the lights they are turning on the lights again and now they are taking them away Okay. <laughs> that is fast. Okay, what are we supposed to do? We have to couple to our own hoppers again. That means Hank needs to be ready to set the switch back to the um, cut of hoppers that we lost uh, in the first place. So again, we don't really need to apply any throttle. We just release the independent brake again a bit and the locomotive will roll uh, roll all by itself. Hank can switch the switch around and come back in the back cab. And we can go couple.
since the other locomotive stopped in front of coupling the cars we will do the same and won't run into it into them and Hank can go and what he did in Canada make sure that the couplers are open so that everything can be coupled smoothly at the same time I just want to check what the other locomotive is doing so excuse me for a while let's see see they are already gone they are already gone yeah it was I don't know where they ah there they are This is where they are sitting at the moment. Probably they are going back a day later and going into this tipple and getting their coal. Okay. Let's care about our own stuff. We are supposed to couple. Hank, you can look from the side if everything works out. The thing is, as soon as we couple to those cars, we will have to apply, apply brakes because as soon as we are coupled to the cars and the brake pipe is attached, those cars will start pulling us downhill. So the independent brake might not be enough. And we have to be f prepared for that. And now we have to cut this cut that we have here again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 cars we have to take and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 we have to leave okay Hank please do that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and why are we doing this because we cannot load more than 7 or 8 cars at the same time so Hank is climbing over here, sitting on this end, so that he can oversee the coal loading from this point here. <coughs> go via location, the tipple. So we have to go ahead and let's just check in which way we are we're supposed to go to the left track. That means the other guy, not Hank, the other guy has to switch this switch around and then we should be going that way oh he changed appearance it took us so long that he regrew his hair Yeah, well, it is the director's cut. I am playing this with all the time in the world. <laughs> so we have a go via, and uh, underneath the tipple. We need to be really slow, between two and three miles. Well, the loco actually can pass this funnel faster because the loco is not loading. Hank, what does it look like from your perspective? Okay. It's 
So you can see we are just pulling our hoppers through this tipple and the coal is supposed to fall into the hoppers and fill them. And we just have to make sure that we're not going faster than 3 miles per hour and not slower than 2 miles per hour. Unfortunately, this locomotive does not have a contraption that makes it keep its own <laughs> Thank you for clipping this. In the Tees Valley DLC, where you do a lot of coal loading, the class thirty seven. British Railways Class 37 has a contraption that allows you to set a speed of 3 miles and then it can keep the speed automatically while you're loading coal. I don't know if this would work in a gradient like this. But at any rate the F7 does not have a contraption of that kind. Here you can see the coal, it, all every it, it stops as soon as one um, hopper is full and starts again when the next hopper is getting under the funnel. Are we going into the correct w route? No, we're not, actually. So, unfortunately, we have to stop our train here. Again, the independent brake might not be enough here. And now you can see that the train, even though we have only a quarter of the hoppers that we had, in the beginning is again almost as heavy as the whole train was in the beginning so the coal coal is heavy not surprisingly well this is what it is so where are we supposed to go we're not supposed to go back we have to we have to put our loaded hoppers Hank is here and you can see yeah filled it up nicely we're going back and have to put this train on the on the right siding. With all the coal cars in the back, it would get speed even more. So the independent brake is totally not enough to slow down the train. So, we have to use our train brake to stop the train so that Hank can get off and switch the switch around. And you can see, even though we are already applying a serious amount 
of brake force. We are still picking up speed. And obviously we could go a bit faster here, I think, yeah, 20, it's a 20 limit. But if you are running downhill here with 20 miles, you will never be able to stop your train at the end of the siding. So how far do we have to go? A bit more. Is it already enough? Yeah, that is enough. So we can just apply the brakes fully. We have to uncouple them. This is why I apply the independent brake fully as well. Um, since Hank needs to come with us anyway, he can do that and come all the way back to the engine and uncouple the hoppers. Where is my lever? Here. Okay, and you can imagine what happens now. Now we have to get the other cut and fill it with coal and then put them together and then drive downhill. Let's just have a look what the other guys are doing. If they already filled their cut of trains. Ah, you can see it here. Are they still here around or are they already done? No, they are still waiting here. Not sure what they are doing. Maybe they are just waiting there for us until we come and get a runaway train scenario. So let's see where we are supposed to go into the middle. That means the switches need to be set accordingly. The guy with the hair will have to do this. Since we have uncoupled, it is enough with the independent brake to hold us in place and then build up some amps. And then carefully release the independent brake so that we do not roll into our cars again. So, in the middle I set, right? So the switches need to be corrected. In the middle we go. In the middle we go, yeah, exactly. Right. And then back.
again not too fast because Hank has to set the, swi uh, the switch here. And let's get our second cut. On the right, obviously, our cars that have already been filled with coal. You can see that all the cars but the last one have those little heaps on them. And the last one is just plain. Okay, Hank can check the couplers. All good, he says. With the coal, well, it is very flat on the last uh, hopper. The others have a bit of an of a yeah, a profile on them. Okay, now what we have is the caboose, obviously. The caboose is a nice thing to have, the problem is it is always an additional difficulty when you're doing the shunting, because obviously the caboose does not need to be filled with coal and it needs to end up to be at the end of the train again. So we just leave the caboose where it is. Let's have a look at the coal loading from that perspective now. And we are going, in which tipple are we going? To the left again. Alright. So not too fast, most probably we have will have to set the switch again because we are always going into this other track for the shunting moves and we're only moving the locomotive. because of the independent break. And in we go.
Again, we need to slow down. Oh yeah, we are quite alone. Nobody's showing up. I think this scenario has been streamed t too many times before. But this does not matter. I am enjoying it. So, you can have a look at the coal filling process again. Maybe you like it more from this perspective. See, it's not so flat here. Flop. It's like a cake in the oven. Just need to be at front at the front to control my speed. Otherwise we will not complete the load coal objective and then we have to run the train through the tipple again because if you're too fast then not enough coal gets into the cars and then they are not fully loaded So, where do we have to go with our train? Yeah, we have to go still to the front a bit. Okay, then we go to the front. Are the switches set correctly? They are. So we will just go on. So, now we have to couple to the rest of the train. We are just going back, so don't know why we went to the front. Hank will have to set the switch at the end of the train. 
So move back and ride on the car. Yeah, you see the last car is always not filled to the brim. The others are... I think this is when the maximum has been reached and then it just does not fill anymore. So... This is quite a difficult thing to do. Because you have to move the heavy train backwards carefully and then couple it gently to the other hoppers. So I cannot really rush it, even though the brake force that I have applied so far is a bit high. It seems, at least as long as we are passing through the tipple. But as soon as I release it, it starts accelerating all by itself. Now we have to stop the train so that Hank can set the switch. and can get back on his ladder and can radio to us how we are approaching and this is one of the crucial spots okay that was too much break with all this application of the break and releasing of the break it's always important that you make sure that you're not depleting your brakes Because you can see we are running quite fast on this on onto those other hoppers. Ah <laughs> I used the emergency brakes so that we don't do not crash into them. And then I will just slowly ease them into them with gradually releasing the independent brake just to get the train moving. The automatic train brake is released and the independent brake just works as a holding brake so that we are not getting too fast, too slow, uh, too fast too fast. <laughs> okay, the independent brake is able to stop the train here and easing those couplers into each other in this gradient with those heavy thingies. <laughs> now it does not really work because Hank did not open the couplers before we did that. Now it works. And now I have to apply brakes otherwise the cars will pull us downhill 
and that is what we did. Alright, what we do now is to get the caboose at the end. For that, what was our thing? We have to take the train further backwards. Okay, we can do that. into an emergency by mistake. I did not want to do that. Out of it. Just reset the switch. Now we can be a bit faster because we're not coupling, but still. train needs to be stopped. And now we have already more than 2000 tons train weight. And the independent brake even in full application does not stop that anymore. too easily that you get into the emergency brake application here, at least for my clumsy fingers. But it's okay, we got into the point where we are supposed to stand and um, Hank has to uncouple all the hoppers because we have to get the caboose. So Hank can go back here. We have to go back to the front in the second. You can actually go into the reverser when the throttle is on. That's interesting. It's only the locomotive. So now the heavy shunting part is done. Now we're only shunting with the loco and the caboose. And then comes the most interesting part of the whole scenario putting the loco at the t at the tip and running downhill that is always my favorite but you might have noticed we do not really need the reverser here all the shunting is done with the gradient alone you don't have to use the reverser for going backwards you just use the hill for going backwards getting our caboose yeah so Hank has to set the switch as soon as when as we are there
set the switch back in the back cab. Is the door open? No, this is just the mirror. So, with only running the locomotive, we can be a bit faster, but don't overdo it, otherwise you will derail your caboose, and that would be sad. After shunting those heavy coal hoppers, and then losing the mission because of derailing the caboose. Right, check the couplers. Caboose coupler is this one. My coupler is here. And couple. So, caboose can be held by the Independent brake alone. Hank can ride on his caboose. Ah, you could see. Because I was too fast with releasing the independent brake, we actually rolled a bit backwards. Let's just check where we are going to the third track we're supposed to go. This might already be set correctly because we set the switch by mistake earlier. No. No, 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 no. We don't want to go in the second track, we want to go in the third one. This is set. This is set correctly. Hair regrow, regrow guy. So that was better. No rolling backwards. And back again.
and the caboose needs to go at the end of the train. One more switch for Hank to set. This one. What what is happening with this rail here? No, there's just a part of the caboose. So we can see it does not matter which way the caboose is attached to the end of the train, as long as it is attached to the end of the train. But it works in both directions. Hank, please prepare the couplers so that they couple properly. Oops. Where is it? Here. And again, full brake uh, brake application until we uncoupled. Otherwise, the cars will pull us downhill. Now it is uncoupled. Now the independent brake is enough. Yeah, it is a lot, and you need actually be focused because it's not so easy to do all that shunting in the gradient. Second track. But now our train is set up and now we can get the loco to the front and, and then go downhill. One more switch for him. I'm actually not really sure why they are sending us once on track 1, one, one time at track 2, one time at track 3, with all those shunting. Camera got knocked away. So, and now obviously we are supposed to get our locomotive and on the tip of the train. And I think that the clever thing to do would be to switch ends and caps now. But this is not what the game wants us to do. It wants us to go backwards now, put the locomotive at the end of the train, and then switch ends. Why this is, I think, the more difficult way to do it, we will see then.
Because the problem obviously will be that as soon as we couple our locomotive to this heavy coal train, <coughs> all the cars will start pushing us downhill. And we need to switch ends with all the cars sitting on our brakes. So this needs to be done with caution. And the game is not helping here. So we're running past our whole train. Just make sure that we're not speeding. 20 is the max here. Oh! That does not look good. Can you see what happened here? The game made us put our train in a position where it is fouling the switch. This should not have happened. Look at that. Hank, you should have warned us about that. This cannot go. This cannot go. Like this. This cannot work like this. And this is the problem if you do not have a crew member at the very end of your train. So we have to pull the whole train uphill a bit more so that we can actually go past this switch. Alright, once more the switch to that direction. And coupling to our heavy train and pulling the heavy train uphill. Let's see if that actually works, if you have enough power to do that. If not, we have to improvise once more and we have to use the other track to go around. And we have to find a way to get the locomotive on the other end. But this is actually why uh, in operating rules it is always stated that you must not foul switches with your train. Now I obviously did not pay attention. So we will have to take this extra tour here. So Hank, prepare the couplers. And as soon as we are coupled to the train here... Oh, 
I apply <laughs> fully. And then we will see if we have enough power to get this train uphill in this gradient. What is the gradient actually? 2.5, it is luckily not the maximum gradient that we have here on this hill. So probably it will be a close thing. Perhaps it works. backwards a bit and now we're going uphill I'm sanding you can hear the sander getting the sand on the track I do not want to apply more power because I do not want to get wheel slips as long as the consist is moving I am happy We are deep beyond the usual working range for the locomotive. So do you think it's already enough? Well, I just go on a bit more to make it sure that the switch is not fouled anymore. Okay, and stop this bitch here. Thank you, can. Yeah, it looks better now. Let's look at it in the map. Yeah, now we are actually around it. This should be enough. Well, just like that, I guess. Just like that. Just like that it will be enough. Oh, yeah. Kabo stays where it is. Well, this was actually an interesting add-on to this mission because it was not long enough in the first place but getting this heavy train started in that gradient with only two F sevens So I hope we won't hit the cars that are a bit skewed over there. If it wasn't enough, we have to repeat. Rinse and repeat. So back to Blue Diamond entrance. The guy in the seat next to us most probably has the longest beard and longest hair on earth. 
by the rate that his hair is regrowing. But no, it stopped. Let's look from this side. Yeah, this is this is enough. This will work. So careful that we do not hit the other cars. <laughs> Is it enough or is it not enough? What do you think? Yeah, we can just inch it. <laughs> I was just like that. So, and now we have to obviously. What? Is it not enough here? Or did we run past it? Now we run past it, obviously. So we have to go uphill again. That doesn't matter, we have to go back anyway. Okay. <laughs> so, switch needs to be set, I guess. Since we came from the other direction. No, it is already set. We don't need to set it. For some reason. Ah, it's the next switch that needs to be set. This is the one that needs to be set. And now, coupling to the train. Okay, prepare the couplers. And then couple. And then, remember, the whole train will try to... The whole train will try to push us downhill then. 
Ooh. So, this is why we apply our brakes with full service. Here. And now we are switching ends and I will just do what the what the game is telling me. Turn off the lights so that we don't have the lights here. Set the throttle to idle. Okay? We can do that. Set the reverser to neutral. Okay, we can do that. Sit in the engineer seat. And that means on the other end. Okay. I stand up. And um, what is that? The train is moving. So if I want to sit on the other side on the engineer's train, I would have to go out of the door and walk to the other end and then the train is running away. No! We don't do that. We don't do that. Emergency brake. So what happened here actually? The game wanted you to sit in the engineer's seat on the other end of the train and so it prepared the brake valve on the other cap already and it put it to first service only and it cut in and this is actually what is the problem here it cuts in this brake valve here and this is not what you want to have it needs to be cut out still here this this brake valve it needs to be cut out otherwise you cannot properly change your caps because you need to shut down the cap on this end and then go to the other side so I yanked in the emergency because this is what keeps us in place at any rate even if the other cap has the brake valve cut in. I don't want to be in emergency but what I want to have at the moment is full service. I put this brake into full service. The independent brake goes into released position not necessarily into bail-off because we need some pressure in the uh, in the brake cylinders and then the rotor valve into fright lap so that the independent brake does not or that this independent brake valve does not interfere with the independent brake valve on the other cap okay that is okay that is okay this needs to be in off position I think because we don't want to have that here interfering and then the generator field and the other thing is here want to be in off position because we want to use the other side of the track so the number lights are go off as well and now the most important thing the brake valve here when we are switching sides it goes into full service then the brake cylinders are full the brake pipe is not completely empty it is because we had to yank in the emergency brake and then you cut this one out and then this setting is saved if you cut it out and you have a full brake application and then you can move this brake lever into release and still we have pressure in the brake cylinders we need to put this into release because it does not uh, it, it mustn't interfere with our uh, brake valve operation on the other end of the train so first full application then cut out it freezes the full application and then we put it into running position release here rotor valve in fright lap and this one then into running after it has been cut off uh, or cut out and all the switches into off position reverse it to neutral usually we would remove it here we cannot remove it idle off then we can actually go to the other side and sit in the engineer seat but if you do what the train tells you you have really a nasty surprise because you jump off your train want to go to the other cab and 
in that time oh the train is going home all by itself and then you can run after your train and try to get back into the cab to take control of it again so now we sit and now we can turn off all the stuff here the headlights to dim the fuel pump the generator field the engine run the number lights on this end and then the game wants us to push the start engine button as if the engine on this locomotive has not been running all the time obviously it has been running um, we have to press it otherwise we don't uh, we don't go on with our mission but the motor is already running so no worries about that set the isolation valve to run what is that now isolation valve I don't think that is what we want to do we need to put the rotor valve into freight in any rate the independent brake into release position and now we are still held by our brake system yeah, we froze the full application on the other end so what we want to do maybe is to put this here into full service application as well before we cut in this thing the isolation valve is this this is a bit of a nonsense it should have been into run all the time because this engine was running so putting this into a start is only if you're actually really starting your engine reverse it to forward transition to notch one we have to do that even though we don't want to do that because we are starting in the gradient unit selector to two that is correct because we have two and set the automatic brake to release okay as soon as I set the automatic brake to release we will just start running <laughs> yeah I just did what the game told us but I did not jump off the train because that would have been okay end of mission the train is somewhere down the valley and I am up in the hills so this is where I said no um, emergency brake and then let's reconsider and um, yeah now we are actually in a position as soon as we release the automatic brake the train will run but I want to use the dynamic brake on this train and you don't really find a dynamic brake lever here but the train has a dynamic brake this is why you set the unit selector to 2 because you want to have the dynamic brake and how do you operate the dynamic brake on this train you need the transition lever and instead of putting it into one series parallel you revert the setup of the traction motors and transform them to generators they are no longer motors they are generators if you put it into B position now we have a dynamic brake and if it, as soon as we apply throttle now we are applying dynamic brake power because the generators on our wheel sets are now drawing out the energy from the turning wheels converting it into electric current and the electric current is converted into heat in some rheostats and uh, blown into the air by those fans here this is why we have so many fans here it's not only for cooling the motor it's also for the um, dynamic brake as soon as I release the brake here the train will pick up speed really fast so we need to be sure that our setup is correct because we will probably not be able to stop it again if it does not work the dynamic brake here cannot be used at once we always need to look at the ampere meter to see that this needle is moving a tiny bit as soon as this needle moved a tiny bit we know that the dynamic brake is ready to work at the same time I will put the automatic br automatic brake back into initial application and then after yanking up the uh, dynamic brake I will set the 
additional automatic brake so that the train does not go faster than 20. But this is really fun here to do because the train is picking up speed so insanely fast. So, let's do it. You can see the brake cylinders are losing pressure and the train will start rolling soon. As the, at least this is what I expected to do. Yeah, and the train is moving all by itself without us applying any throttle. And you can see that the needle here already moved a tiny bit into the scale so that we can Can we? I think we can. But we actually need Can we hold it below the 20? We probably can. But just like this. This was a bit hectic. All the same. I just leave the air brake where it is and try to control speed with the dynamic brake because the dynamic brake can be applied and released as we need it. The air brakes need to be released fully before they can be used again. So we have a reduction of about 25 or not a reduction but we have about 25 PSI in our brake cylinders in the air brake. And with the throttle lever, I can adjust the dynamic brake. And since we started in this 3.5 gradient, it the train picked up the speed so incredibly fast. And I think now we are back in a 3.5 gradient, 3.4 at least. And it is good that we still have a bit to go up with our dynamic brake. <coughs> but you see, again, like in the Cajon Pass with you, a mixture of dynamic brakes and air brakes prevent the train from going too fast, even in an insane gradient as this is here. Okay, Hank chose to set chose to sit on the coal. Now let's put him back into his caboose. But the important thing with the dynamic brake on this locomotive is that you wait a bit until the needle has moved this tiny tiny bit so that you can be sure that you're actually applying brake power and not traction power. So now I am down to idle with the dynamic brake and we are still losing. What is this gradient here? Maybe it is already lessening too fast and I have too much air in my 
air brake most probably you know that from the Cajon Pass stream as well a running release is usually not a good thing to do but we will do it and just apply less air brake alongside our dynamic brake here the hardest part of the gradient has already been dealt with let's see if the first application is enough probably it's not we need a bit more and we went beyond the 20 all right so the initial application of the air brake is not enough here we need a bit more let's see if what we have now is enough about a reduction to 80 psi So AJ, you can be relieved, there will be no more shunting, we just have to take down this train to the siding where we started, and the honks were for the level crossing. There is a level crossing, I have to admit I was a bit late, but still, better late than never. One thing before you go out on the open track from this uh, side line or branch line there is one of those red signs close to the floor that we talked about at the beginning of the stream I will contact the signaler just to make sure that we do not spat out before b because we pass this this sign I'm not sure if I will manage to stop the train in front of it okay I'm not sure if this was a level crossing maybe it was just a bunch of rocks that fell there again the honk cord is getting dangerously close in front of the speedometer
Yeah, for future reference, 80 psi after the a really heavy gradient should be enough on the air brake. Here you could see again on, on, the sig uh, on the switch indicators that they sometimes change their appearance during approach. Where is... Yeah, there is not a lot of room in between. The good thing is that the trains are more or less confined to the tracks and unlike cars they cannot sway too much to either side. And if they do, then something major went wrong. Ah, this is not a level crossing, this is a junction. Well, can't hurt to honk. Oh, isn't that a nice view? With the with the creek and the woods. Chill, you have to be a bit more patient. I know it's it's long today again, but we will be done soon. There, no, there's not a reduction. Would be nicer in winter, yeah. Unfortunately, I cannot switch it here. So, running release again. Another try if it is enough to stop or slow down the train with the dynamics. This bridge actually marks the end of the really heavy grade so maybe the dynamics are just enough can you hear that sound? ding 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 like something hitting our cars I wonder what that was
Ja. Is that a level crossing? I guess it is, right? So now we are getting close to the spot where we are going back on the main track. This is the part where we have almost no gradient. Well, at least here we would have had, or we would have been required to make a running release. Otherwise, the train would have stalled here. But I guess there is no point in going back to traction, although, no. I think this is the point where we can go back to applying traction instead of using the dynamic brake. So that we do not get too slow here. Am I still applying? No, I'm not applying brake force, am I? I don't know if this works the same here, if you don't wait enough. So now we are out of it. Now we should be ready to apply traction force again. Sounds like we are applying. Yeah, and the speed is picking up. But cautiously, because of this red sign, I think it is still a bit, but here we turn on our light, by the way. Oh, we don't have any lights. Why don't we not have any lights? We should have had dim lights, at least. But we did not have any lights. If it is too dim, we don't see anything. No, now it works. I see. So obviously you have to switch it to f bright first before you switch it. Can switch it to dim. So. Um, So 
So can I stop the train in front of the red flag here? Or will I just ask? I will just ask. I will not stop this train here. <laughs> and the signal allowed us. So if you want to do this properly here at this point, you should know that this red sign is there. And should slow down before you can see it so that you can actually stop your train in front of the red sign and then ask the signaler when you're standing there not when you are already about to run the red sign now we're going back on the main line this is why there was this red sign that we do not just run out on the main line if there is another train coming on the main line. But luckily there was none. So, this is the part with the little tunnel that we started this service with. I think here we can actually go faster than 20, yeah. But since we have to slow down to 15 there is not really a point in going faster than 20 but we don't need to be too pushy about slowing down what is important is that we go on the siding as soon as the tunnel is behind us with not more than 15 and on this siding we will stable our train and then this service is done or this scenario so this honk was for the tunnel AJ did not switch on the gouge lights So remember when we started the service here? We waited for the other train to pass. Now we're going back on this siding. Last thousand yards and then this scenario will be played. Yeah, and as I said, it is not a scenario that you play three times a day because it just takes some time and it takes a lot of focus and I and I played it like the fourth time or the third time now and even then it wasn't perfect because you always need to be so focused with all the shunting in the gradient
but this is it is really one of the all-time greatest scenarios in the game because it's challenging it is inspired unfortunately the instructions are not always the most helpful but if you know how to operate your machine then even those instructions won't interfere with your handling the machine properly So we could switch back to the dynamic brake for the stopping at the end, at least until we get below the 10 miles. It could be still effective, but I don't think it is not worth the bother. We will just stop the train with the auto brakes. I hope Twitch will not cut off the last two minutes. Last 100 yards are closing in. Oh no, we are too fast. And fouling the switch again, aren't we? No. Well, we did, to be fair. So we should have stopped a bit early, because this is not the way that we can actually leave the locomotive. Because we're not fouling this switch, but we are fouling that switch. But anyway. We would have to set back the train a little. Yeah, see how many stops we had. 16. Okay. And all this back and forth and back and forth in the gradient. And here we, unfortunately, on our way downhill, we <laughs> oversped a little. Well, anyway, I had a lot of fun with this scenario it is really one of the greatest in the game and it makes you really try to understand your locomotive thank you AJ for coming with me on this thanks everybody and uh, see you next time